Love it or hate it, the Creation Club in Fallout 4 is jam-packed with new weapons, armor, safe houses, settlement objects, and quests that can add quite a bit of flavor to an already richly detailed game. However, due to the cost of having to purchase non-refundable Bethesda credits in order to purchase what are essentially minor mods, many folks may wonder whether many of these items are actually worth the cost, which is why we at Grey Gaming decided to jump on that grenade in your place so we could offer our honest opinion on the quality of each Creation Club add-on. Today, in part 2 of a 3 part series, we will be looking at all armor and power armor added in the Creation Club, minus a few items that we already included in part 1 because it just made more sense to review some of these items as a bundle. So before you leave a well-meaning comment saying we forgot an item, you might want to check out part 1 beforehand if you haven't already. Since we're on the topic of disclaimers, let's address the big ones. Not all Creation Club content is available year-round. Some seasonal content is added when it's relevant to a particular season and then removed when nobody cares about it anymore, so there may be some content that we weren't able to purchase because it was removed from the store when we were loading up. For this series, we purchased about $120 worth of CC content, including all weapons, quests, workshops, and of course armor kits available around March 31st of 2023. We will not be reviewing skins, that's just a way to make everyone grumps. Armor will be ranked on a scale of 1 to 5 according to 5 key categories, weight, defense, buffs, quest acquisition, and lore friendliness. For weight, armor will be compared to the grade of combat armor it most closely resembles. Anything that weighs more than a full suit of heavy combat armor, 50 pounds, will be docked a point. Mostly, this category is to give us something already in-game to compare to. Armor providing equal or greater defense to an equivalent vanilla combat armor set will receive one point. For power armor, we will simply be comparing to whatever suit is closest in terms of defense. Armor that provides additional buffs, like plus one to charisma or a unique effect, will receive one point. Armor which is acquired through quests will receive one point. For this purpose, a random NPC or container just sitting out in the commonwealth somewhere does not constitute a quest. And finally, armor which is lore friendly will receive one point. So for example, a set of armor that weighs 40 pounds, one point, offers superior protection to sturdy combat armor, one point, increases AP regeneration, one point, is acquired through a quest, one point, and does not conflict with any current lore, one point. This would receive a perfect 5 out of 5 rating. Oh, and I wrote this script as I completed the CC quests, and since I didn't know which of the dozens of new quests in my queue were related to which add-ons, I just had to write the reviews as they were encountered, so these aren't going to be in any particular order, and my level of snarkiness will vary depending on how many garbage add-ons were encountered before I found a good one. I'm not gonna lie, I had pretty low hopes for this power armor, so I might come off as a bit biased here, but the first suit I encountered was the Hellfire Armor. In Fallout 3, I exclusively used the Winterized T-51 since it never broke down, and I found the Hellfire to be pretty lacking and way too heavy for the trouble. I seriously thought that I was going to find the Incinerator, since I planned on saving all the power armor till the very end, but alas, when you're trying to pick through dozens of new CC quests without much other info to go on besides Investigate, Location X, or Access Terminal Y, those well-laid plans are pretty pointless, so here we are. The Creation Club claims there's a quest to acquire this, but it's just an NPC with two buddies hanging out in the open commonwealth, so no point there. The NPC wearing it is a total pushover, instant drop from a single shot of the atomizer. For those of you that were hoping for a challenge, sorry, you'll have to go somewhere else for that. It's not a guaranteed frame though, so you still have to either have a chassis laying around or have the caps laying around to purchase one before you can raise hell. The Hellfire is just a tiny shred better in one category or another compared to its X01 counterpart, so it's actually better than any standard vanilla suit. I was also pleasantly surprised to find in addition to all the usual modifications, there are faction specific paint jobs, so that was a nice touch. They went that little extra mile for the design and it was nice. It's just too bad they sort of wasted it on the Hellfire, which is probably the ugliest suit in all of Fallout in my opinion. Using the objective scoring system, the Hellfire is a 4 out of 5. I'll probably keep it just to have a set sitting in my power armor museum, but honestly I probably will never use it. Then again, I don't play on survival, so power Power armor is not really a necessity for me anyway. 
I like the premise of the Sentinel power armor system, but I'm not quite sure how I feel about the execution. There's not a lot that I can say without spoilers, but the quest needed to unlock the Sentinel is actually pretty engaging. Actually, I think it's my favorite so far with all of the CC quests. But the end result is sort of, I don't know, not game breaking, but definitely would take a lot of the struggle out of early game survival runs. You end up accumulating 6 suits of T45D power armor, 3 suits of vanilla minus the helmets, and 3 suits with the helmet sporting the outcast paint job from Fallout 3. You don't get any of the frames, but I can think of three frames sitting around nearby that you could easily load these onto. The Sentinel suit itself is sort of what I expected it to be, but that's neither a good thing or a bad thing, but it's definitely not great. The Sentinel is functionally an invisible NPC with a robot voice which you can set between various robot voice styles, including a very patriotic one which just tickles me pink. Glory is the reward of valor. It always wears its power armor frame, but you can swap out whatever power armor pieces you want. The main problem is that it has two modes, follow me mode and stand exactly on the spot mode. I would have preferred it if it was closer to the automatrons so you could assign it to settlements, provision or routes, etc, but it is strictly a permanent companion. It does sort of serve as an additional mule since you could strip it every time you go out and as you pick up power armor pieces you could just attach them to the frame. It doesn't replace your active companion so you can have a Mass Effect style party of three only without the decent companion pathing and combat behavior because this is a Bethesda game. I would have personally preferred it if the Sentinel system was a series of robotic components placed inside an empty power armor suit rather than the suit itself having the computing power to run on its own, but that's just personal preference to make it a little more lore friendly. Otherwise, it's not bad. I'm not sure I would drop $7 on it. Actually, I'm definitely sure I wouldn't drop $7 on it. Uh you know, if I hadn't done exactly that just for new YouTube content, but it's far from terrible. I'll give it 5 out of 5 stars, not seriously game breaking, but adds just enough to the game that it's worth looking into if you can get it cheap enough. After the ease in which I was able to gather a fully leveled suit of Hellfire power armor, I assumed the XO2 power armor would be just as much of a letdown. I was wrong. The quest line of finding the XO2 is pretty good. I won't make any spoilers, but it's probably better than half of the quests in the main game. I know, someone will still point out in the comments to the effect of, that's still not saying much. It strikes a chord that is near and dear to my heart when it comes to service members and first responders and the stressors they experience even long after they've hung up their uniforms. It's actually surprisingly deep for something that could have just as easily been a simple fetch quest, but the climax really caught me and motivated me to finish the quest, rather than just trying to get it over with so I can try and make the money back I spent on it by talking about it on YouTube. The armor itself isn't really anything to write home about. At level 46 I found it in Mark IV variant, but I'm not sure if this changes based on your level. Fully maxed out, it's actually slightly worse than the X01, which is somewhat comical considering it's supposed to be the improvement over the original. But I suppose they needed to leave some room for the Hellfire armor to be better. Aesthetically it's pretty cool, and they did include a number of armor color options which weren't present in the Hellfire, but unlike the Hellfire, doesn't have any faction-specific paint jobs, and as much as the questline really drives home the idea of patriotism, it would have been nice to include a new variation of the patriotic paint job just for this suit. But hey, my favorite green paint job doesn't look half bad on it. All things said, the extremely slight difference in protection between the X01 and X02 is nitpicking, so objectively, I'm willing to give it the point and rank it 5 out of 5. And if you're going to be Todd Howard's simp by actually buying CC content, you could do a lot worse than this add on. What does every Fallout brony need? That's right, a set of power armor decked out in giddy up buttercup parts. Getting it is simple enough, though not exactly easy. It's a pretty rough dungeon in a fairly inhospitable area of the map, so it's not going to be something you're likely to grab at a low level, and probably for the best because this stuff is tough, like second only to the Hellfire power armor. It's a little surprising since we're essentially talking about Raider power armor, all cobbled together with random chunks of sheet metal and toy parts. I was expecting only two condition levels, but surprisingly there are the full six typical of pre-war variants, and the fully maxed out version is comparable to X01 in most ways. It also has a number of color options available, and like most other armor on this list, different colors offer different buffs. It's certainly not lore breaking given the existence of other imper- 
it's certainly not lore breaking given the existence of other improvised suits of power armor and the other weird things that have been done with giddy up buttercups, and I can't really fault it for its OP stats, since it's not something you're likely to get your hands on early in game, and even then it's possible that it would just spawn in with a lower tier variant. At level 48, it spawned as Mark VI, so all in all, I'm willing to charitably give it a 5 out of 5, though calling its acquisition a quest is, yeah, it's pretty charitable. For a brief, extremely brief moment, I thought I had met a winner. Yes, I'm going to spoil this one, but hey, the Creation Club description tells you most of this before you buy anyway. You start by tracking down a suit of T-51 painted with one of three new custom gunner paint jobs, and you are tasked with repainting it with one of three new custom Minutemen paint jobs, and you are then sent out with an army of Minutemen to retake Quincy. I was pretty stoked because I had been intentionally avoiding Quincy because I wanted some flyby footage of the gunners doing gunner things. Whoops, too late. I gathered up Preston and together we executed a little Commonwealth justice on the likes of Tessa and Clint. Inside Quincy, there was an additional gunner wearing a suit of gunner painted T-60 and assisting the Minutemen was a Minuteman with an appropriately painted Minuteman T-60 suit. The whole thing was an epic firefight, perfectly suited to the Minutemen main storyline, and you finish by raising the flag over Quincy and it's gone, quest over. I get that these Creation Club add-ons have limited resources that they can use in order to improve the game, but even just making minor musical cues could have cemented this as one of those must-have add-ons. Using the epic combat music that triggers when you fight the likes of Deathclaws and Mirelurk Queens instead of the standard combat music would give the player the feeling that this is a fight worth seeing through. Even the cathartic little tune that plays when you find a new location upon raising the flag over Quincy would have added to your feeling that you just accomplished something great. It was so close to excellence and fell just short. Still, it carries more weight than some quests that were included by Bethesda in the base game. Ranking this one is a bit tricky since the only thing really added by it is skins, and we already said we weren't ranking those. But the quest itself, the one guaranteed power armor frame, and pieces of multiple suits that were added does provide a bit of entertainment factor and gameplay value. I'd rank it 4 out of 5 only because of the little criticism I mentioned earlier. Capital Wasteland Mercenaries. So this one is another one of those that doesn't add much, but what it does do, it does pretty well. You hop on a vertebrate and fly it to DC. Yeah, they didn't strain themselves coming up with a backstory as to why Nora Nate now has flight training. But anyway, you arrive at GNN Plaza in the Capital Wasteland and find a battle ensuing. You do Nora Nate things and go home. There's a lot of Fallout 3 referencing going on and a lot of outfits that are based on the various NPC clothing choices in Fallout 3. And in attempt to combine the one-piece combat armor model from Fallout 3 with the multi-piece sets in Fallout 4. I'm not sure they nailed it, but it looks like a decent attempt regardless. It's really just there to add a bit of nostalgia for those that played Fallout 3 in the distant past, or in my case a few months ago so I could gather the footage I needed for YouTube content. Only one of the new outfits are what I would classify as armor, and it's sort of inferior to even basic combat armor despite the appearance of being pieced together in slightly gutted mixes of sturdy and heavy parts. I loved the faithful recreation of GNR Plaza and was actually impressed just how well they incorporated the Fallout 3 style buildings into the surrounding ruins, but honestly, once the nostalgia wears off, it doesn't really add any additional value to the game. 2 out of 5 stars. This is going to be a short review. There really isn't a quest to get it. It's sitting in a box in the open commonwealth. No dungeon dive or investigation necessary. The armor itself isn't bad. It's fairly lightweight and offers a decent ballistic damage protection but no resistance to energy or rads. It does not appear to have any mods available and is pretty unremarkable in every way except it's basically a permanent stealth boy which is sort of the canonical purpose of this armor in the first place. However, one of the problems with this type of armor, your weapon also also becomes invisible, so no aiming down sights. You're sort of stuck hip firing, which is sort of Fallout 3's deal. It doesn't fit my playstyle, but I'm sure for melee builds it's probably a powerhouse. I'll give it 3 out of 5 just due to its lack of energy and rad protection and no quest. 
I spoke briefly about the Captain Cosmos add-on in our weapons list, but I also sort of flubbed my script a bit. I said that you were just exploring the ruins of an old theater, and thankfully nobody caught me and corrected me on it, but it still bugs me, so I'm correcting myself. Yeah, you heard me right, I admit my mistakes. You are in fact exploring a television studio where they filmed the Captain Cosmos TV show before the war. I rather enjoyed my experience, though there wasn't that much to it, but the whole thing felt very Fallout. Throughout most of these CC quests, it's very apparent that the stories you're being told aren't actually native to the Fallout universe, they're injected, artificial, separate. But the Captain Cosmos pack, as goofy and as quirky as it is, felt very much like you're exploring an actual piece of the Fallout universe, even if for just a tiny moment. The CC-00 Captain Cosmos power armor is probably what a lot of people are interested in. It makes a fun little space noise when you climb in, and it has the exact same specs as the T-60, and while it seems closer to the X-01 in aesthetics, I think comparable to the T-60 is still fair enough to give it the point. It sports a number of custom modifications, including Tesla coils, which makes it look even more spacey, and it includes variants of the hot rod paint jobs, faction paint jobs, including the Enclave for some reason, and pre-war promotional paint jobs for the companies that had a hand in designing it, Arcjet and Repcon, at least according to the add-on there, the ones who designed it. There is also the Captain Cosmos spacesuit, setting aside how ugly it is, it offers pretty heavy rad resistance at 750 and no energy or ballistic DR. It can be dyed different colors and its moon boots can be upgraded to increase your jump height and prevent fall damage. Not my cup of tea, but it's definitely unique in the Fallout universe. I think the downsides of both can be overlooked as they are minor and valid arguments can be made that we're just nitpicking, so I feel safe ranking these together as 5 out of 5. All things considered, you could do so much worse in the Creation Club. Speaking of which... Do you remember Prey? It was a Bethesda game from like 2017. It was so well hyped that even Ireland's greatest national treasure, Miracle of Sound, composed a fan song about it, apparently unaware that more people were interested in listening to techno music about Prey than were actually interested in playing Prey. Well, Morgan's spacesuit is a reference to that game's protagonist, so yeah, definitely not lore-friendly there. It's sort of a love child between the space costume from Nuka World and the undamaged hazmat suit, offering an impressive 1000 resistance to rad, 5 ballistic DR, and 50 energy DR. It's quite a bit better than either of the in-game equivalents, which only offer the damage or the rad protection respectively. I suppose objectively, it's a decent suit to roam the glowing sea in, but still a bit too lacking in the protection department for my liking. It also pops right into your inventory, so no quest, no need to do anything after leaving Vault 111, just instant resistance to rads. So a little on the game breaking side there. Objectively, it's a 3 out of 5. So I made a disclaimer about this in the weapons list, but the end card must have made it hard to read, or people just couldn't be bothered to read it, or they just really like reminding me when there's something missing for these lists, but here goes. The Fantasy Hero set is supposed to add two iconic items from Skyrim into Fallout 4 under the guise of being gear used by LARPers. I say supposed to because the Steel Sword did not spawn on this playthrough just flat out noped right the heck off. As such, I couldn't really do an honest review of it, and I think you should be aware that if you're buying this add-on for the sword, you might have reason to be slightly pissed. When it does spawn in, at least according to the Fallout wiki, it's superior to all of the vanilla swords by a pretty hefty margin, so I guess it's good, but I couldn't verify this because I didn't have it. The iron helmet that's added is more than twice the ballistic damage of the combat rifle, but a fifth of the energy resistance, so I guess there's still enough of of a trade-off that you wouldn't just be running around screaming Fus Roda at every behemoth and deathclaw in the commonwealth willy-nilly. Objectively, both items are a 4 out of 5, losing a point for not being lore-friendly, but, you know, items might not spawn. And with that, I think we're ready to wrap up. I'd ask if there was anything we missed, but I know I can trust you folks to let me know regardless. Do you think I was unfair to any of these add-ons, perhaps a bit too generous? I'm looking forward to part 3 where we take a more nuanced approach to reviewing the safe houses and workshop add-ons which are going to be more subjective, controversial, and probably more triggering than all of the weapons and armor combined. However, while we work on part 3 of this series, you can check out some of our other great content here at Grey Gaming, or if you're interested in science fiction, we have another channel, Grey Galaxies, where we discuss a wide variety of sci-fi topics, mostly lore related. Until next time, I've been Grey, stay safe, and we hope to see you here next time on Grey Gaming.